All right, this is functional programming for WordPress developers. Kind of a different talk. I, I just kind of threw it out there as a, as a topic, and um, I'm glad to see I was selected. It's something you don't see at a lot of PHP conferences, a lot of WordPress conferences. It's really kind of a, a buzzwordy, kind of popular thing in the programming community. And I'd love the opportunity to introduce it to a new audience who might not be exposed to it and, and get you all really excited about something that has honestly changed how I approach programming these days. I don't want to spend too much time again because I got a lot of slides to get through, but here's the obligatory slide about me. My name's Dave Ross. I work for 10UP. Uh, we would love to work with you, 10up.com slash careers, if you're the type of person to attend a talk called Functional Programming for WordPress Developers. I'm going to guess you're the type of engineer I would love to work with, even if you're not. Go visit our website, find out about the kind of clients we work with, and, and send a resume our way. We'd love to talk. Uh, me in general, um, I'm that weird friend everybody has who still tinkers with Commodore 64s and Apple IIs, and I play 8-bit NES games when I'm not chasing a toddler around. That's really what you need to know about me. Um, I put this link up earlier. Um, if I, the, One of the challenges putting a talk like this together is it isn't putting together a slide template. It isn't practicing the talk over and over. No, the biggest challenge is taking code and fitting it all on one slide in a font big enough that the people in the back can read it. Um, so what I did is I put my slides up on GitHub. I actually don't see a lot of laptops out in the audience, which is kind of surprising. But if you would like to, to pull up the slides and follow along on your own machine, I, I encourage you to do so or pull it up on your phone. It should work just fine there. A lot of this talk relies on a library that I wrote called Functional Programming Utilities. I am a software engineer. I am not a marketing person, so that is the name. Um, it's up on GitHub. Um, again, if you download the slides, that, that's an actual link to it. You can just click on it. Um, there are other functional programming libraries that work similarly, but uh, all of my examples are going to be based on using that. One of my promises for this talk is you will not have any functors, endofunctors, monoids, or monads. Functional programming is a very academic topic. Um, it's from the academic world of computer science where they, they have their own conferences where they don't have functional programming for WordPress. They have functional programming for functional programming's sake. And because there's this, this isolation, I really wish there wasn't this isolation between the academic programming world and, and the, the corporate programming world or, or the kind of work we do. But there is, and they've got their own language, their own lingo. And since I want this to be kind of an introductory talk, we're not going to dive into some of these more buzzwordy terms. Um, I will say monads are amazing. They kind of flipped the relationship between data and code on its head. I, I, it's one of my favorite things about functional programming, but it's not for this talk. I'd like to start with some history, because I am that guy, right? What we consider programming now dates back to the 1830s with uh, Monsieur Jacquard and his Jacquard loom, where he had this idea of taking these, these pieces of cardboard and he punched holes in them. And, and he took these punched cards, you might call them, and he strung them together with twine, and he made kind of this roll, and he fed it into his automated loom. And out would come a textile to make a, a shirt or a rug. Um, actually, the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, has a picture of Monsieur Jacquard done on his loom. It's, it's the original pixel art, OK? It's amazing to think that somebody programmed this loom to make a picture of a person, even before photography was around. And so this, this idea of this punched card carried through to the, the census, the US census in the 1890s, and IBM's early business tabulation and computation machines. And then to the big brains, or the, the electronic brains that helped the US and the UK win World War II by breaking Nazi codes. And we kept with this pattern of feeding data into the machine through these, this 
sequence of cards. Following World War II, you had John von Neumann, Presper Eckert, they're, they're thinking, what if we could feed instructions to the machine that same way? Because up to that point, to make a computer do something even slightly different, you had to get in there, you know, roll up your sleeves, start rewiring the machine. They thought, what if we had stored program computers where the, the program itself was stored as data? In fact, I'd love it, you know, go, go dig up uh, Jean Bartik's autobiography that came out a couple years ago. She talks about creating the first assembly language, basically. And she had to figure out what instructions a CPU would have to do because nobody had done it before. And, and there was a lot of thought that went into this. Now we take it for granted that you have jump instructions, comparison, uh, you move things to register. None of that existed yet. They were really at the, the ground floor of all this. And this was a style of programming that's come to be known as imperative programming. It's literally defining things step by step. Do the, set this variable, do this thing, do this thing, check the value of the variable. Okay, if it's not what we want, jump back to this label and do it all again. And it mimicked kind of that, that feeling of feeding punched cards into the machine, instruction by instruction, and making the computer work. And that kept us going for about 10 years. Along that time, we made serious improvements in the number of transistors we could fit in a computer, as well as how much storage we had available. We went from practically no storage, a couple of bytes, to drum disks and, and even the first hard disks. And we started exploring this idea of what if we could write more source code? What if our code was more verbose? We, we started seeing procedural or structured programming. This idea that we can, we can have a looping structure. Instead of using go to to go back to this label, what if we had a for loop and we could loop through all the elements in this array? And once we do that, what if we took the body of this loop and we could move it to a function or a subroutine that we can call over and over again? And sure, it takes up a little more space on disk, but the code's much more readable. And the body of this function is isolated from the rest of the program. And it was a big step forward because also at this time, computing is moving from military applications to the business world. Ten years later, you, this seems to go in ten-year steps here. Now, we instead of um, just extra data storage, now we have extra memory capacity. This was really driven forward by the space program. We, we made serious leaps in the amount of, of memory that computers had. So we started talking about object-oriented programming. Back then, you had a computer system, right? It's not like today. You had a system, and you could have an object representing a car or an object representing a t-shirt. And all of your programs on that machine would be able to make use of that same car or t-shirt by passing messages to it and getting responses back. That's not what we consider object-oriented programming today. Today, we follow more of the C++ style architecture, where we have objects within a process, and they receive, you know, they, they have uh, properties, and they have methods that we can call and, and get, you know, variables back. Um, either way, it's still a major leap in how we structure programs. It allows us to encapsulate data. It allows different teams to work on different components in isolation and have them all talk to each other by calling uh, methods on, on the objects they create. It was a big step forward. I don't, I don't want to poo-poo it too much. Ten years later, we've made this jump. Now CPUs are starting to, to advance. Okay? We, we've seen you know, increases in storage, in, in RAM. Now we're seeing CPUs make leaps forward. We have 16 and 32-bit data buses on mainframes and microcomputers, or, or mainframes and mini computers, excuse me. On microcomputers, we're finally able to reach one megahertz, to do one million operations a second. And now academics are looking at this abundance of computers. It doesn't sound like it today, right? This abundance of power. And they're saying, what if we can make the computer do the work? Instead of us explaining the com to the computer how to do things step by step like we did in the 1940s, what if we explained what we were looking for 
and the computer figured out how to get us the result we wanted. And you've got languages designed for functional programming. My example here is in PHP because we're at a WordPress conference. But the idea, idea is generally, instead of an explicit loop, we're, we're using a function called array walk here. And the PHP knows how to walk an array, and we're telling it what to do with it. Uh, um, SQL is a good example of a, a language like that, where you do a query, right? You're saying select these fields from this table where, where it meets this criteria and sort it by this. And it's up to your database management system to parse that out, to know what you're looking for, and get you the data you're looking for. Um, this is kind of the same thing applied to programming. Why, why, why am I so excited about functional programming? Why do I think it's such a big advancement that I'm willing to do a conference talk on it? I'm a big fan of that declarative style of programming, where I don't have to hold the computer's hand and teach it to do things step by step. I want to declare what I'm looking for and have very well-tested code, the same code run by the rest of the community and millions of programmers around the world. I want that code figuring out what I'm looking for and, and applying the logic that I created. I love this idea of building complex behavior from small functions, from small, very well-tested components. Functional programming, by its nature, prevents certain types of errors, and we'll get into that in, in further slides. And it's just an intellectual challenge. I mean, I don't know about a lot of you, but I got into programming because it was fun. Let's make programming fun again. So I talked a bit about the declarative style, right? Where, where you know, we're used to doing programming in this, this mode where we're explaining to the computer how to do every step. We're saying, create an array, loop through every value in a different array, and then do something to it, and then append the value to this, this scratch array you created. And that, that's great. We've all written code like that. It works very well. But in a declarative style, we're able to say the, to the computer, give me an array that looks exactly like this other one, but add five to every element in it. And again, the computer knows how to take those instructions and, and make something out of it. If you come onto this talk with any one thing, um, I'd love it to be PHP's array functions, which I think don't get enough attention. Um, there's a link there to the, the php.net uh, manual. I would love for you to go through that page and just see what features PHP has that you're probably already duplicating in your own code, but it's all built into PHP already. Specifically, array walk, array map, and array filter mimic three very core functional programming structures, um, iterating through an array, mapping an array, and filtering an array. Because functional programming comes from the academic world, there's kind of a, a set of principles behind it. And for something to be considered functional programming, these are the ideals it should strive for. For a language to support functional programming, functions need to be first class citizens. And that means you can take a function and assign it to a variable. You can pass a function to another function. For example, uh, add action or add filter in WordPress, that second parameter can take a function. Hey, functional programming allows that. And you can also return a function from another function, which becomes very powerful, as you'll see in, in future slides. Functional programmers try to minimize the amount of state in a program the amount of, of variables within a function or the amount of global data. Uh, because state introduces a set of problems where values aren't quite what you expect them to be. There's this concept of referential transparency which gets its own slide. And this idea that functions shouldn't have side effects. So let's talk a little bit about first class functions. Here's an example from WordPress code where I have a function that just echoes Hello Dolly, which tons of WordPress installs do millions of times a day. Here I'm, I'm creating a function that just outputs that, and I'm passing it 
to the add action function from WordPress. And I'm saying, in the init action, run this function. And I can do that because functions are first class in PHP. Again, minimal state is possible in WordPress if you're willing to, to write in that functional style. Here I'm doing, I'm, instead of doing a for each loop like I'm doing on the left, on the right I'm using array walk. And I'm passing a function to output the color. Well, the nice thing is, if you look at that first example, after the loop is done, dollar sign color still has a value. It's still holding that last color in the array. Whereas if we try to minimize state, if we isolate that state to just within that function we pass array walk, outside of that loop, color doesn't have a value anymore. It doesn't exist. And this presents a whole, or prevents a whole class of problems. Because you're, you're more sure that your variables are isolated to the scope you expect them to be in. And values that you expect them to have. I could reuse dollar sign color somewhere further down in the program and not expect it to be yellow. I could expect it to be an object. But if it's still holding on to that value, that could be a problem. Referential transparency is just a fancy way of saying, if I have a function, I can replace the call to that function with the value it returns. So let's say I have a function add, and it, I want to add two and two, and I get four back. In my, in, in my code, if I say dollar sign $x equals add two and two, I can just as easily say dollar sign $x equals four. And everything else around it just works because that function is referentially transparent. It's not going and updating a database record. It's not printing something to the screen. It doesn't have any side effects. It's not affecting global variables anywhere. It's literally transparent. It's just doing a thing and returning a value. And when you have functions that are referentially transparent and they don't have side effects, then it's considered a pure function. I don't know how many of you remember high school math. I'm sure a lot of us have blocked that out. Um, I remember just the purity of these functions where you just have f of x equals x plus 1. And any time you feed it a particular value of x, you always got the same value back. And there's that mathematical purity that functional programmers want to bring back to programming, that, that reliability that a function is always going to return what you expect it to do that you can rationalize about these functions and know intimately what they do and not be surprised when it corrupts a database table or does something completely unexpected. Now that's the ideal world. And from an academic perspective, if you're working in a functional programming language like Haskell or Clojure, it's something you're mostly going to be able to achieve. In a language like PHP, especially when you're working with WordPress, right? WordPress has a ton of global variables. It's got API calls that depend on those global variables. It's got a database. It could be doing API calls out to who knows what third-party service. Not everything you're going to write in WordPress is going to be pure. And I want to set that expectation before you start trying to apply these principles to your own code because it's, it's the impossible dream. What you can do is isolate those impurities. You can write, write a pure function that adds two numbers together or iterates over an array and does a certain amount of things and returns a, a different array. You can isolate that into its own pure function and know that it's something you can, you can depend on and rationalize about and still have 90 other functions out there that work with that dirty world of the WordPress API that's doing all these impure things with databases and, and output to browsers and so on. You can use a proxy pattern. Going back to that object-oriented programming world, you can use a proxy pattern to build a seam between your beautiful, pure, functional code and the code that actually needs to get stuff done and interact with WordPress and inter interact with third-party APIs. Again, not everything needs to be pure. And one thing I like to do is when I'm writing code, I just leave a comment to myself that says, this is not pure, please fix it. And then a couple months down the line, when I have a chance to revisit it, maybe I'll get the opportunity to rewrite it. 
But until then, I have to live with the fact that, again, not every function is going to be pure. It's the reality of the world we live in. And again, this is an ideal goal. Don't kick yourself too much if, if you're not able to achieve it. Going back to that, that kind of intellectual challenge of functional programming, there's this, I, this goal of getting functions down to one parameter. And the nice thing about that is when you have a function that takes one parameter and returns a simple value like a string or a number, it's a lot easier to reuse. It can also be composed, and I'm going to show that in a, a future slide. That's really exciting. You build these pipelines of functions. Well, how do you get a function down to one parameter? Because obviously, like in the WordPress API, we have functions that take two, three, four, five, six parameters. Well, one thing you can do is called partial application. Going back to this idea that functions can return other functions, you can call the partially apply function on, let's say, add action, right? I'm sure all of you are familiar with add action from WordPress. It takes two parameters, the name of the action you want to hook into, and a function for it to call. So here we're partially applying add action. We're saying set the first parameter to init. And now we have a new function, I call it add init action, you can call it whatever you want, but anytime you call that, it registers a function to the init action. And you don't have to pass that first parameter. And here you have an example of me just saying call foo during init. By, I don't even need to mention init anymore, it's in the function name. That's the beauty of partial application. You can take a function, and you can call it over and over. You can take a function that has two, three, four parameters and partially apply these parameters one by one and get a series of new functions that take fewer and fewer parameters until you're down to just one. And this allows composition. Composition is this idea that you have functions that take one parameter and return one value. And if they all return the same type of value, they all take the same type of parameter, you can chain them together and build complex functionality from, from these individual, again, hopefully well-tested components. A good example here is I'm taking string rot 13, string reverse, and string to upper from PHP. Again, these are core PHP functions. They're, they have unit tests. They're used by millions of developers around the world every day. We know how they work. We know they work. And we trust they work. And without writing any fancy code, I'm able to compose them with one call and create a new function that applies these three functions to a piece of data. And I can pass, it, pass that new function, the string, hello WordCamp Boston, and it just goes boom, 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 and returns a rot13 reversed uppercase string. And because I know the components that this pipeline is built with work, and because I know this compose function works, I can trust that the function I've built from these small components is going to work. I'll still want to write unit tests because I'm paranoid, but I, I can be reasonably sure that things are going to work the way I expect them to. This is one of my favorite functions from WordPress core. It's absint. It returns the absolute value of an integer. And when you pass absint the value negative 5.2, it's going to convert it to an integer value. OK, so negative 5. And uh, take the absolute value of that, so 5. And it's a really simple function. It's, it's referentially transparent. It's pure. It's beautiful. I love using this in all my code. Here is the same function built with composition. So I'm able to compose absent from absolute value and int val. And it works exactly the same way. Negative 5.2 is converted to 5 through the exact same process, except I'm not explicitly writing a function. I'm not explicitly calling those other two functions. When I started, or when I proposed this talk, and you probably saw in the description, I mentioned currying. And currying is one of those buzzwords. And I, I actually left this section out of my initial draft of these slides. I put it back in um, because I promised I'd talk about it. Currying is, is kind of like partial application. It's where it lets you get a function down to a version that takes one parameter. 
Only instead of calling partially apply over and over, you know, whittling it down to one, one parameter at a time, when you call curry, it's going to return a new function that takes one parameter. And then you're going to call that function with one parameter. And it's going to return another function that takes one parameter. It's a way of incrementally passing parameters. In, instead of explicitly saying, I want to partially apply this over and over, you're just calling this sequence of functions over and over and just passing parameters until it says, OK, I've got enough to go on. It knows at that point. And I, I didn't want to include this in the talk because really it's one of those things that doesn't make a lot of sense in PHP. Um, it's really good in more functional native languages. Um, it is kind of popular to see in JavaScript as well. Um, but I thought I'd show it as just another way to achieve those same ends. Hopefully, I've gotten you excited about this. Hopefully, I haven't thrown too many new terms at you or too many code samples. It's kind of hard to read, you know, the audience. You're all studying the code pretty intently. Um, so I wanted to suggest a couple books about this that I love. First is Simon Hollywell's Functional Programming in PHP, which takes a lot of the concepts that I talked about in, in a half hour session here and, and some more things like monads and just expands upon them for, for the length of a book. And the second edition just came out. I really recommend reading it. It's, it's a great introduction to functional programming, again, with an understanding of the trade-offs that come with doing it in PHP. Also, a great book by Adam Wathen, Refactoring to Collections. I talked about array map, array walk, and array filter. These are collection functions. And this is an entire book that's going to try and change your way of thinking about how you work with arrays and groups of data and show you how you can apply these collection functions to, your, to the data in your code and eliminate some of that, that state and, and make things a little more functional style, a little more pure. And I think we have a few minutes left for questions. Anybody got any? There's a microphone over there. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. There are a few functions in there called uh, curry and compose. Mm -hmm. um, those are something that you could use either by yourself or you could use the library you were showing earlier. I, my library, uh, just in case anyone didn't hear that, the functions curry and compose and partially apply, um, those are in the functional programming utilities library. There's also other functional programming libraries for PHP. They're all going to pretty much use the same function names because those come from the functional programming world. But yeah, um, I originally did have actually the source code to those in my slides, and I thought it was too much of a distraction. But yeah. Um, Take a look at the Curry one if you get a chance. It does some crazy stuff with the reflection API and, and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the idea is, you know, I've got unit tests for all those functions. You can tr kind of trust that they're going to work. But yeah, that's where they come from, from that functional programming utils class or uh, library. Anyone else? OK, well, oh, yes. Come on down. Hi, so um, let's say that we're not working with PHP, we're working with the languages and here in the functional. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that you want your functions to not have side effects. Mm -hmm. So, how would you do like a database change or something? Oh, I love that question. So, if you're in a functional first language like Haskell or Clojure, how do you write code with side effects? There is this concept called the IO monad. And the dirty little secret of functional programming is this IO monad is where all that impure code goes. So you have an IO monad for your screen. And you can pass, the idea of a monad is you pass a function to your data instead of the other way around. So you pass your data to this screen monad, and it outputs it to the screen. And you, you know that's what it's doing. You know it's not a pure function. But the code you're, the function you're passing to it is pure. 
So you're in the clear. It's the language that's doing the bad thing. <laughs> and the, I mean, right, if we're going to write useful programs, they have to output things. They have to store state somewhere. But you can create this environment where the code you write is as pure as possible, even if the environment it's running in isn't. And that's really the trade-off. As long as you go into it knowing that's what's going to happen, I think everybody in the functional programming world has just come to terms with it. <laughs> that's a great question, though. Thank you. Um, what is the impact of performance uh, on functional programming in non-functional uh, languages? I assume that it would be more difficult to optimize I actually took a slide out of my talk on that, so thank you so much. Uh, so the question is, you know, what kind of performance impact does fu a functional programming style have, especially in a non-FP language? In a more natively functional language like Haskell, it's, it's able to parallelize operations. If you're iterating through an array of 500,000 items, it's going to take advantage of the 32, 64, however many cores are on these, these server class computers these days. And it's going to be able to split up the workload. And because everything is pure functions and, and everything, it's, it's going to be able to split it up and get you the result faster. PHP, by its nature, it's single threaded. It knows there's global scope everywhere. It can't make those assumptions. So there, first of all, there's overhead for all these function calls that are happening. When you call array, array walk and you pass it a function, it's calling that function over and over and over. So there is overhead for those function calls that really can't be optimized away. And there is just the overhead of the fact you're doing it all in a single process. It can't be parallelized like that. So the code is going to be slower. Um, how much slower, considering we're running two gigahertz processors and, and so on. In, in terms of real clock time, it's pretty minimal, but yeah, there is overhead, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to deny that. What I will say is the extra cost of the CPU to make it run faster is prob still probably less than you'll pay a programmer to deal with those kind of scoping issues that it's preventing. I, I think just like any anything in programming, it's a trade-off. Thank you, though. That I love that question. Thank you. And hopefully, you know, in the future PHP versions, they'll they'll bring parallel processing more into it, and hopefully, we'll get to the point where that workload can be distributed more, because the server certainly can do it. Yes. Sorry, the impact on what? Test. Oh, um, yeah. Um, so the, the question of minimizing uh, side effects and the special impact on uh, unit testing. Side effects almost become an extra parameter to a function. When you have a function that's referencing a global variable, it's changing the state that that function lives in. So even if you're not passing values to it explicitly, what it does depends on the other stuff out there. It depends on that API. It depends on that database table. It depends on a global variable. So when you're testing, you know, we, we set up all these complex mocks to, to mock values in the environment the code runs in. But if we have a pure function that doesn't have side effects, that doesn't have to care about that outside world, then we're able to just test that function directly. We can write tests that just pass parameters and get values back and not have to worry about any of that other stuff. So our tests become a lot cleaner. Um, we don't have to test as many situations. Again, and that, that's the ideal world. You're still going to have code that interacts with the outside world, of course, because that's inescapable. But so your tests for that code are, are a little more complex. I mean, that's, Again, it's a trade-off, but as far as your, your pure functions go with the minimal side effects, their, their tests are going to be a lot cleaner. What would be an example of a WordPress plugin or extension, uh, or just a PHP app out there, code that we can see on the GitHub, an example of a great functional uh, programming extension? 
I wrote a series of blog posts. I, I don't know of any actual production uh, WordPress plugins that are written in that style. I've certainly tried to do it in my uh, HTTP2 server push uh, plugin. Uh, but again, you know, it, it's a WordPress plugin, so it's going to have global state. That's just unavoidable. Um, it, I did a series of Medium posts called Functional Programming for WordPress Developers. And in, I believe, the second post, I did an example of a plugin that adds a SHA-1 signature to the bottom of a comment. And I do that by composing and partially applying functions. Uh, both within PHP and within WordPress. So that at the end, it's, it's this string of partial apply calls and, com and compose calls, and then at the very bottom, there's one function call. <laughs> and it just sets all these pieces in motion. So if you want to see an example of, of real WordPress code, besides these little two, three line snippets, that's a good place to look. Um, just Google for functional programming for WordPress developers on Medium. Thank you. And great plug for my uh, blog post there. <laughs> I think we've got just a couple of minutes left uh, if we got one more question. Doesn't look like it. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the great questions. I love this. I, I'm glad to see so many people interested and excited about this. Thank you so much. Thank you.